Our first speaker is Dr. Frank Kobilen. He is an epidemiologist and professor of global health at the Amsterdam University Medical Center, the Netherlands. He is scientific director of KNCV Tuberculosis Foundation and serves on several expert panels and advisory body for global infectious disease control, in particular tuberculosis, including the WHO Strategic and Technical Advisory Group for Tuberculosis. His topic uh, is a uh, new TB diagnostic and the biomarkers. So please join me. Welcome, Dr. Kobilen. Thank you, and um, let me see how this works. It's the latest version. Thank you very much for the organizers to, to invite me and uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, there we are. Um, I will be talking about novel TB diagnosis and biomarkers. This is my declaration of interests, and uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. And I'll start uh, about what's new in TB diagnosis. Um, I, I was here last year, gave an overview of diagnostics in TB, and I know Professor Propan would like me to just, just uh, uh, repeat that presentation, so I'm only going to focus on what's new since last year, and then move to the biomarkers and to the various type of biomarkers markers there are and their potential for uh, for use in TB diagnostics, and then some concluding remarks. So what's new in TB diagnosis since last year? Well, not an awful lot, actually. Um, there is something going on in the molecular assays, in the point of care or near care molecular assays. You all know about Gene Expert and Gene Expert Ultra. There is the TB LAMP assay that has been endorsed a couple of years ago by the WHO. But there was actually a rapid communication out this week by WHO that announced that this new test, TrueNet, not HIFNet, but TrueNet, MTB, MTB Plus, produced by the Indian company Mobio, uh, actually showed pretty good results in a large study by finding a number of countries in, 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 uh, compared to TB diagnosed by culture and overall sensitivity of 83% of overall specificity of 99% and that they expect this to be uh, to, to issue guidelines, recommendations about its use in the coming uh, months. Um, this is, I, I think it's slightly more complex uh, preparation than in gene experts, but it has otherwise, it has the sort of same turnaround time. Um, another thing that's really new is, a, is urine diagnostics. You're probably aware of lipoarabinomanam testing. Which, uh, uh, which really took off when ELEA came, came out a couple of years ago with this lateral flow test. Now, the Fuji company has uh, done something similar, and they really sh have shown that the relatively poor sensitivity for lipoarabinum and numb testing thus far was mainly an analytical problem, because this test clearly shows a much better sensitivity. So this is a... Uh, a, a study that was done by Andrew Kirchhoff in South Africa among HIV, uh, um, among people living with HIV, uh, two cohorts of, uh, of presumptive TB patients. And as you can see here, the, uh, both for extrapulmonary TB, the Fuji LAM uh, test performs much better, and especially also for pulmonary TB. And this is looking at uh, extrapulmonary TB, the various types. And what you can see is that in particular for uh, for TB meningitis here, and for plural tuberculosis, the sensitivity of Fujilam on urine is much better than for ELEA, for the ELEA tests. And uh, we, were, we were expecting a, um, uh, a WHO um, recommendation on that soon as well. So uh, these are really the things to look out for. But this is basically what's there. There isn't an awful lot new at the moment. So I will move on to the diagnostic potential of host biomarkers. There is a lot of interest as of recent in biomarkers. This shows you what you get if you just type tuberculosis and biomarker in PubMed. You get almost 5,000 hits, more than one third published since 2015. So there's a really, there's really an, an, an epidemic of biomarker papers. Um, and there is, uh, uh, I think, potential use in, in, in the number of fields that are relevant today. I think the, these are the four that the four uh, use cases that are important, especially also correlates for of vaccine protection. But what we're going to talk about now today is about diagnosis and triaging and prediction of TB disease or diagnosis of incipient tuberculosis. WHO put out uh, target 
product profiles for that, and these TPPs are meant to guide test manufacturers, researchers, and funders as to what is needed by the field, so that we don't come up with things that we basically don't need, and also that they are evaluated in the right way. This is one of them. This is uh, one for a non-sputum-based biomarker test for TB detection. The rationale of having such a test is that it allows us to better diagnose extrapulmonary TB and also diagnose pulmonary TB in patients that do not expectorate, and we know that this is often true for people with HIV. Um, the desired characteristics of such a test would be that it could be used at the health post level without a lab, that it should be same-day diagnosis, so point of care, minimum sensitivity of 80%, depending a bit on the type of, uh, of disease, and a minimum specificity of 98%. There is a, uh, another one that is for a commun community-based triage test. Now, here, this is a test that would allow you really at a community level, at a health post level, at the first contact point of a patient with symptoms, to actually sort of triage a patient as to, yes, this patient may have tuberculosis or no, this patient won't have tuberculosis. So it is really meant to, uh, to, to triage patients for further diagnostic procedures. So the desired characteristics there would be that it, is, that it can uh, detect or at least give an idea about pulmonary and, and or extrapulmonary to be, can be used at community level, would be rapid, allow immediate referral, have a high sensitivity, that's what you require of triage tests, it's a rule out test, and not necessarily a very high specificity. Specificity is then a matter of cost effectiveness, basically. So it has to be very inexpensive. You don't want something expensive. So you want to come up with things like, like a lateral flow test, or maybe what, we, what I, I know that people are now looking at is a cough app. Some you, you, just, you just cough at your, at your cell phone, it will tell you, yes, you might have tuberculosis. So something very simple. And then there's another one for which WHO put out a, a TPP two years ago, and that's for a TB prediction test. And I think the thinking now is that a test that would allow you to tell that a particular person will get TB in one or two year, years' time is basically a test for what they call nowadays incipient tuberculosis. So it's basically a test for someone who doesn't have clinical tuberculosis yet, but is there in those months, and we now know it's months before they actually get clinical TB. So you actually want to diagnose the patient already here. And, that, and the rationale for having that is that will, it, will give you, uh, uh, it will allow better targeting of preventive treatment. Sometimes it means you actually have to give curative treatment so you can you diagnose much earlier, before, actually before transmission starts at, at, at scale. Um, so, for example, in exposed household contacts, but for example, also in people with HIV on, on, on ART who, for example, have had a short course of, uh, of preventive treatment already. It should be uh, used at the health post level by staff with minimal lab training. Doesn't necessarily have to have an awful lot of sensitivity or specificity, at least not at minimum, but should uh, allow for same-day results. And you'll be looking at test costs for around up to $5, so not tremendously uh, cheap, but also not too expensive. And why we think that this is actually true, this incipient uh, TB uh, uh, idea, uh, is very well um, illustrated by this paper by Tom Scriba from South Africa, where they looked in these large cohorts of household contacts of infectious TB patients, followed them up for getting TB, and this is this time point zero. This is when these people got their tuberculosis. This is the time until they got it. And this is tells you which of all these markers were already show changes and when that started. And you can see several of them already started to sh show changes a year before diagnosis and all did within uh, before, before half a year before uh, 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 diagnosis. And these are some examples of them. For example, here the interferon uh, response, the, 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 the all sorts of inflammation markers. This is the complement cascade. This is monocytes going up and T cells going down. We'll talk more about that later on. Here, for example, you see HLA DR plus um, and central memory CD8 cells. So there's a lot happening long before a patient is clinically diagnosed with tuberculosis. So I, I grouped the host biomarkers that we'll be discussing uh, in, in these five groups, T cell activation or differentiation markers, such as CD27, HLA-DR, immunoactive proteins, such as interferon, interferon gamma, IP10, CRP, 
gene expression profiles. You will hear a little bit more about all these RNA signatures, blood cell counts like the monocyte lymphocyte ratio, and small circulating modules, uh, uh, molecules. Now, it is important to realize that very often in biomarkers we look at signatures. These are combinations of biomarkers, and by combining them you improve their, their sensitivity and specificity. Uh, but the problem also is that if you combine biomarkers, it's much more difficult to translate them into point-of-care assays. If you have just one or two analytes, it's simple. But if you're working with maybe 30 analytes, it's going to be very, very difficult. So for today, we're going to focus as much as possible on single markers and signatures that have, signatures that have just a few markers. Um, now, the, uh, most of these biomarkers that are relevant for diagnosis are markers of inflammation. Um, and different aspects of them are different for different uh, uh, diagnostic use cases. But the, it's important to realize that if, if you look at diagnosis or triaging, you want your biomarker to to indicate TB-specific inflammation. So for example, uh, CRP is an acute phase protein, and we know, yes, it is increased in patients with TB, but it's also increased in a number of other infectious diseases. So the key comparison really here to find your biomarker is to look at TB disease versus other diseases. Whereas for prediction, it is really TB disease versus latent TB infection, and you're looking at early inflammation markers, not necessarily very specific for tuberculosis. And screening, we won't talk much about uh, screening, but just to give you an idea, so this is in healthy populations to see who might have uh, uh, tuberculosis, um, for example, an active case finding. You would be looking for any inflammation, and you would compare, your main comparison would be TB disease versus health, uh, the healthy. Um, it is also important to realize that we can get useful information from treatment of TB. And that is because what happens during treatment, to some extent, mirrors what happens before patients get, uh, get TB. And this has been very well illustrated by this study that looked at uh, two uh, RNA uh, 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 signatures. Um, this one is, uh, was meant for prediction. This one is meant for diagnosis. This is the moment when the patient gets tuberculosis. So you see that the score on the signatures goes up in the months before diagnosis, and then treatment starts, and then it goes down again. So it's actually mirrored. There's a mirror in this one as well. So this part can actually give us information about that part. So I want you to keep that in mind. So let's start with the T cell activation and differentiation markers. So I think there, is, there are a few that, that have real potential. One of them is, and that comes from the, 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 the clinical trial a couple of years ago in that vaccine that failed, MVA85A in South Africa, where they actually showed that the, that the um, infants that were vaccinated had a higher progression rate to disease if they had, H, if they had a high level of H, uh, HLA, DR positive CD4 cells, whereas total CD4 cells was not predictive. And they looked at it in a different cohort to validate this, and indeed, I mean, it wasn't terribly good, but still it shows some separation between those who progress to disease and those who do not. Uh, uh, other information comes from studies of treatment. This looks at, uh, at, at a couple of markers. This is, uh, this is CD38, this is K KI67, this one is HLA-DR. Uh, uh, and you see that there is a clear drop-off uh, during treatment. That's not the case for CD27, but CD27 gives a very clear separation between latent TB infection and, 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 and tuberculosis disease. So these m might be useful for diagnosis, this one might be useful for prediction. Um, there, is a, the, uh, there is, of course, something that is already there. There is a test already there. It's not, uh, not exactly a point-of-care test, although I know that the company is working on a point-of-care version of that. That is the, uh, the quantiferin. The latest version of quantiferin, the quantiferin Gold Plus, actually has two tubes, TB1 and TB2. TB1 has uh, CD4 antigens only. TB2 has both CD4 and CD8 antigens. And you can actually calculate what the CD8 response is by looking at the differential. And what this study shows, this is a study from Taiwan um, that looked at active TB patients and their contacts. So these are the, act so these are the, 
contacts not infected. These are infected with the other, uh, measured by the other quantiferon. These are patients with TB disease. These are those with TB disease that were actually culture positive. And you can see that whereas there is no difference really, of course, for these, but not for the LTBI and the TB cases, there is not really a difference in responses to TBI and TB2. Uh, you see that for the CD8 response, there was a real difference. So, and, and there was a higher CD8 response in those who had tuberculosis, so especially high in those who had culture positive TB disease. Now, it's not yet a very good separation, but there is potential here. Let's move on to the immunoactive proteins. Now, this is a slide from last year. Next slide will also be of last year, but I think it's important. This is the study that was, uh, that I think really showed that CRP is promising in TB. That was a study among uh, HIV positive uh, adults initiating ART in Uganda. Uh, and they used CRP, point of care CRP testing and had sputum culture as the reference standard. And you can see there was a pretty good sensitivity and specificity. And if you would took an 89% sensitivity, your positive predictive value that the patient actually had tuberculosis was 34%, so it was really great. However, I think we have to keep in mind that this is, so patients starting ART is a sort of comparison with healthy subjects to some extent. So if you, and this is, this is exemplified by this uh, systematic review that looked at nine different studies uh, for, T, for uh, CRP as a triage test, so this is the, uh, this is the curve, and this is where these studies are. But you can see that in outpatients, HIV outpatients, HIV positive and HIV negative, so there is a reasonably good specificity, that's the green bar, but in inpatients, it's actually much lower. So the, the, and this is probably because here, patients have all sorts of diseases that also raise your CRP. And another, Example comes from IP10. I think IP10 is another uh, 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 immunoactive marker that I think has, has a lot of interest. Uh, there are P there's currently work going on to, to, uh, to produce a lateral, simple lateral flow test on IP10. This is data from a meta-analysis of 18 studies looking at IP10 in whole blood or plasma. Uh, and as you can see that there is there's quite some heterogeneity, but still the majority of these studies are, show a quite good combination of sensitivity and specificity. And I hope you can read it, but what you can see, it didn't really matter as to what sort of these study design it was, age didn't really matter, the, the method by which IP10 was tested, and whether there were HIV-infected uh, uh, individuals or not. So, it, so the, the accuracy was more or less the same, but the problem is that most of these studies were comparing with healthy individuals. So here you may be looking at the same problem. But once you start using it in a patient population that's symptomatic, they may have all sorts of other disease that also raise your IP10. There is a, a potential other interesting way of using IP10, and that is during the early stage of treatment. This is work from, from, uh, from a group in the Netherlands that showed that there is a very quick drop-off in IP10 during the first seven days of treatment, especially in patients who are HIV positive. So these are TB patients on treatment. You can see these are HIV positive, these are HIV negative, and this is, uh, uh, w this is a reflection of the bacterial burden, high bacterial burden, low bacterial burden. And you see it doesn't really matter. So in HIV positive, the HIV positive patients you have usually very high baseline uh, IP10 levels, and most of them show a drop-off. And you don't see any drop-off in those who don't, in the end, turn out not to have tuberculosis. And that could actually be used, and that's been shown now in a study from Mozambique, could actually be used to, in patients who, in whom you have difficulty of diagnosing them, to actually show by just giving them a week of treatment by the decline in IP10 level that the patient actually had has tuberculosis. Another one in this group is complement Q1, uh, one Q, I should say. So it's the uh, and and this is this is I think an interesting um, study. The interesting thing about complement Q1 is that it is it is induced by interferon gamma, but it's not an acute phase protein. So you would expect that it sort of has less re reaction, less response in patients who have uh, different, who have other diseases than TB. And they actually showed this was the case. So they, they compared TB here to 
healthy controls, but also to leprosy and sarcoidosis and to pneumonia. And, and you can see that it's actually quite higher than in the, much higher than in the pneumonia patients. And this is showing you the ROC curve. And you can see here, this is the comparison with pneumonia. So this is a potential marker in diagnostics. Um, the interesting thing is that it was not affected by BCG vaccination and that they normalized also in during treatment. So let's look now at the whole blood RNA signatures. There's been a lot of interest lately in these signatures. It all, and and the, uh, some of those signatures look pretty good. So for example, here you see at validation data the, uh, of, for a diagnostic signature, but that's based on 44 RNA transcripts. So the way this works is that you take patients and you take healthy controls, or, or patients in this case with other diseases, and you look at their uh, and you look at their RNA, uh, 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 so so they do a whole genome RNA sequencing, then do the bioinformatics, then uh, do a, 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 a machine learning uh, kind of analysis, and then come up with a particular combination. Now, but this is 44 transcripts, so it all looks nice. But 44 transcripts you're never going to get into a point of care test, so it's all fine, but. Can we do anything with it? The same, I think, to, so, to a large extent is true for this progression to disease signature that got quite some attention. It was published in The Lancet uh, three years ago by Zach et al., uh, also from South Africa, which really showed that you could actually predict that someone would get tuberculosis, as you can see here in the validation cohort, but it's still 16 genes, so a very difficult thing to put in a simple test. So people have been looking at, at simpler, smaller signatures. This is one, this was a prediction signature coming, coming out of that same group in South Africa. And you saw, she, here, see here the validation data. It is not, it is not tremendously good, uh, but it shows some signal. Um, another one that I think is very interesting is the one that was derived in a different way. Here the authors from Stanford actually looked at a number of data sets from a number of countries. So they were, they were bioinformatics data sets. And then they just run their algorithms and they came up with this three gene transcriptional signature. And what this is showing you is how it performs when you compare active tuberculosis cases to healthy control, so a sort of screening kind of use case. And this is the validation set, and you see that here in this, this, and in this um, uh, cohort, so we look at the various cohorts, so it was actually quite good uh, performance. This is doing the same thing, looking at other diseases, and you can see that there is a reasonably good performance in some of the cohorts for this one. And this is looking at prediction, and actually there it was pretty good. It was uh, uh, one of the better performing signatures. So this gene, this three gene signatures caught a lot of attention. It was one of the signatures that was studied in a head-to-head -head comparison, taking the same sort of approach, putting all sorts of bioinformatics codes together and then running, running the, uh, uh, the signatures. This looked at uh, 24 transcriptomic data sets and they came up with, so this is the whole list, this is the area under the curve, specificity, and the ne negative predictive value at a certain prevalence. And they showed that there were two of these signatures, that was this one that I just mentioned, and this one, that uh, met the minimum target product profile uh, uh, requirements for a triage test. Now the problem here is these, this is looking at RNA, and this is, largely meant as a triage test when you use them as a diagnosis. And the question, of course, is can you ever put this in a test that was just one or two dollars? Probably not. So it, mean, it means that triage will be, tri this technology will probably not be useful at all for triaging, even, even though a lot of funding, research funding is going into this, to be, on, to, to be honest. But there is potential, I think, for uh, prediction. And that's what's shown by this head-to-head -head comparison. That was that's not yet published, but it's out on the internet. Uh, looking at 17 uh, published RNA uh, signatures, again doing this uh, uh, meta-analysis in various uh, cohorts. Um, they looked at, they found an overall of these are they, these were the eight best performing signatures that you see here. Now the first thing that you see is this is the peer, this is the interval to diagnosis of TB, and you see that clearly they become better when you get closer to diagnosis, as you would expect based on what we showed earlier. Um, overall area under the curve was 70 to 
they more or less behaved all in the same way, they had more or less the same performance, at the specificity of 90% sensitivity for the three months interval was pretty good, for two year interval not very good, and the pretest at the pretest probability of 2%, the positive predicted value that this person actually gets tuberculosis in, in uh, over a certain period of time was less than 10% for two years, more than 10% for three months. This is comparing it to our current IGO, it's only two to 4%. So it's better, but it's, we're not yet there, but it's promising. Now, a few words about circulating cell counts. The main thing to mention here is the monocyte to lymphocyte ratio. And this shows you data from uh, 71 patients with active pulmonary TB and cure TB patients. And you can see that those with active pulmonary TB clearly have higher ratios of monocytes to lymphocyte counts compared to those who have cured TB or to those who have latent TB infections or are healthy controls. And interestingly, it is, it is as you can see, it's mainly the monocytes that are, that are this, the monocyte absolute count that are clearly higher, whereas the lymphocyte count is actually lower than in cured TB patients or in LTBI. So this is an interesting one. And I've been Two studies looking specifically, or, and there are, there have, and, and there is work on going, going on also here at, at Hifnat and Chula Longhorn uh, to look in, in the cohorts here. Uh, but the, uh, what they actually showed is that this is from uh, HIV-infected adults starting ART in South Africa. This is this is the one for the the five percent uh, um, highest ML ratio. You can see that this really predicts that. Uh, that people, that, that persons get tuberculosis over a short period of time. And this was looking at pregnant women, testing them around, uh, around delivery, and then following them up postpartum. And here you can see that also the ML ratio was significantly associated with getting tuberculosis. This is a very easy thing to do. You just get it, it's just a result of your routine lab. So there's a clear potential for diagnosis of incipient TB or early TB and people living with HIV as part of ART monitoring. Now, a few words about small circulating molecules. So now this is something similar as I've shown you before. This is also from these big studies that have been done in Africa, just showing you that uh, there, is a, there are quite a number of these molecules, so there's metabolomics that differ between TB, active TB, TST negatives, and TST positives. And this is, for example, you get this whole list. We'll not go into them, it just gives you an example. So people have been trying to do signatures. For example, this signatures came out recently in Nature Communication. So of, of 10 different um, uh, metabolites, and then they show there's a reasonable protection. But this is probably not the way forward. Probably the way forward is to use a more hypothesis-driven approach. And this is looking at the ratio between kynurinin and tryptophan. And this ratio is altered by, by the activity of an enzyme that's called in, in diolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, known as IDO. And we know that IDO is a very important enzyme in the integrity of granuloma. It's also very important in the protection against uh, cancers. So, for example, IDO blockers are now in vogue for treatment of, uh, of various types of cancers. And this is a study from, from uh, uh, among 70, uh, 754 in HIV-infected adults in South Africa. They were followed six monthly for four years. And you can see that this is the ID, so this is the time point. This is, a, this is 12 months before uh, tuberculosis. This is the time during, at tu when tuberculosis is diagnosed. This is during treatment. You see a very nice, uh, uh, increase in IDO during that time point, Incre the increase al already starting from half year before, um, before treatment. So there is, uh, and you see also here very clear separation when you just look at the averages. So there is, a, there is really a potential here. They're not easy to measure, but they could potentially also be measured in breath, and we're working on that at the moment in our in institute. Uh, some concluding remarks. First, Biomarkers may behave differently in different subgroups. It's very important to realize. Most of the markers, even though I've given you a few examples or, or in, in, in HIV-infected populations, most have been studies primarily in adult HIV-negative patients. So in the HIV-infected where we, where we know there are low CD4 counts and where there could be potentially different responses, they may behave uh, differently. The same is true for children. So these biomarkers need to be validated in various subgroups. The second one, is that 
we know at least for these signatures, but probably also biomarkers, may behave differently in different geographic populations. This is looking at some of those signatures, the RNA signatures, and they, this is a comparison between various cohorts in Africa. So you can see here quite a bit of difference, quite a bit of difference here, quite a bit of difference here. So that means already within Africa, there are clear differences in performance that may reflect genetic background, it may reflect comorbidities, uh, maybe other things, but it, it shows that there is a clear need to validate biomarkers outside Africa before we're going to use them at scale. And then finally, there is, and I've already uh, uh, said that, there is a clear need to translate biomarkers and signatures to field feasible platforms, point of care tests that require limited staff skills that can be done with limited laboratory requirements and that are inexpensive and ideally that are non-invasive such as saliva tests or breath tests as you can see here. So there is clearly still work to be done and I will leave it at that and thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions.